Welcome to the International Trade Law Class. My name is Ms. Kitenji, and it's my pleasure to take you through this class. Last week, uh, we had, we went through documentary credit. We did part A. Now we are going to look at part B. And we would want to see how the seller and the buyer would actually get into um, contracting of the third party who is a bank so that we could now have the documents prepared and the money set aside and released, um, the shipment, whatever it is to be released, so that all parties' um, obligations and also needs are met. Okay. So let's go through this together. Um, now, you can see that there's a table that has been presented before you that has four parties. It has a buyer, it has a seller, it has a bank, it has uh, the issuing bank and the advising or confirming bank. Okay? So I would like us to look at it from this point of view. There's a buyer and there's a seller. Who have step one is that they have a commercial contract, which is a sale, which is a which is an agreement of sale that they have signed and stipulated what they want to be recorded therein in terms of what are the terms of negotiation. The buyer then picks that sale document and goes to the issuing bank, okay, and requests for a documentary credit to be opened. Now, when he does that. Then the issuing bank will communicate to the advising bank and say, listen, we have been instructed to uh, open a documentary credit on your behalf. And here is a documentary credit. We have prepared it. Thereby, we are now issuing it to you for this sum of money. And we have uh, kindly notify the seller. The advising or the uh, confirming bank then notifies the seller that a documentary credit has been created in their favor concerning that sale agreement. Okay. Now, once that is done, step five would be that the seller would release the goods to the buyer because Essentially, there's an undertaking. Remember, we said the documentary credit is an undertaking. There's an undertaking stating that we are going to pay you this sum of money as per the terms of the contract. Now that we have an undertaking, the seller has already been notified by the advising bank that there is an, um, a documentary credit has been issued. He releases the goods. Once he releases the goods, the seller then takes the original documents to the advising or the confirming bank, okay? When he takes them there, the advising or the confirming bank then sends the document to the issuing bank. The issuing bank will receive those documents and countercheck them against the sale agreement in terms of what the parties had agreed. A documentary credit essentially should have a hundred percent compliance okay with the uh, in terms of in terms of what is in the sale agreement and what has been reflected in the documentary credit so once that happens if the the documents are okay the bank will uh, essentially the issuing bank will check the documents if they are 100 percent in compliance then they will pay the money to the advising or the confirming bank. Are we together? Then at the same time, the issuing bank will debit the buyer's account against those documents. Okay? So it will be saying, listen, we have paid two million on your behalf, and that that sum will be debited to the buyer's account in the issuing bank bank's uh, portfolio. Now, once that is done. This advising and confirming bank will make the final payment to the seller. I hope that is clear. So as to make sure that we have understood what we are talking about, I'll run through it again. Step one, there's a conclusion of the contract between the, past, uh, the customer, the supplier, and the importer who is a buyer or the exporter. Okay? Now, 
Where, then after that we have the opening instructions where the client requests his bank to open a documentary credit that must be notified without, um, without confirmation and fills out a form specifying the documents required for the importation of the goods. Now the bank will check the credit worthiness of the customer. Remember when we were talking about the guarantee last time? When you're saying that you check the moral, if there's any surety, somebody who can stand in for this person, and if they have that sum of money in their account or they have the ability to pay that sum of money, okay? Then it also ensures that the instructions are clear and complete. Now, step three, it will open the customer's bank uh, letter of credit and send via Swift, net Swift Network to the supplier's bank. The buyer then receives a copy of the sending. After receiving the credit, the supplier's bank verifies its authentic authenticity and it, if it is subject to the UCP um, rules, then it checks if the instructions do not contain um, any errors. It will then notify the seller's bank. The seller's bank will then notify their client that they have received a letter of credit in his favor. And upon the receipt of the notice, the recipient checks if the specified conditions are in accordance with what has been established during the negotiations. When we're negotiating and we're signing a sale agreement, we need to make sure we are in turn, those, those documents are in tandem. If the beneficiary does not agree with any clause, it must ask the buyer to change the conditions. Okay? Step number five would be the goods. Now that we have met all the conditions, the goods are delivered and the recipient sends the goods and prepares the documents requested in the instructions of the credit. Then the documents are remitted to the bank, the beneficiary, will, who is a seller, will submit those documents to the advising or the confirming bank. And once he submits those documents, then the, seller, the seller's bank will verify that all the documents comply with what was required in the documentary credit okay if errors are present the client is no longer guaranteed to be paid now the document the documents once delivered to the seller's bank are then now delivered to the buyer's bank the issuing bank now when they're sent to the issuing bank um, the the seller's bank would be saying here are the documents kindly pay up Step number eight would be the buyer's bank, which is the issuing bank, would be very fine to ensure that all the documents that are there are in compliance with what was required in the letter of credit and as per the terms of the contract. Okay? If everything is okay, then it will make payment less the applicable fees. Now, the buyer's bank account debits against those documents. What, what are we saying? That it will go back to its client's account and debit the sum and say, we have paid this on your behalf, you owe us this amount of money, okay? Less the applicable fees, then the, once the client pays out, then they are able to clear the goods and take possession. Remember, money has already been sent to the um, seller's bank, the confirming or the issuing bank, and once they receive the sum of money, they will make payment to the seller, which is the last step, okay? I believe that is very clear. Now. Apart from documentary credit, there are other additional modes of payment that are applicable. There's pre-payment, pre-shipment, where the importer has to pay the exporter using telegraphic transfer or international check before the exporter ships the good, goods. Okay. Now, on every other kind of modes of payment, you will find that there are risk levels for the importers and the exporters. Next, we have documentary site collection where the importer pays the exporter after the exporter has shipped the goods. So the importer needs the shipping documents to clear goods on arrival. The bank holds the documents until the importer pays for the goods. This is called site payment or sometimes known as documents against payment. There are also risk levels that affect the importers as well as the exporters. Of importance would be that air freight companies usually release goods to the importer immediately, even though they may not have been paid. That's a, well, that would be an exception. Then we have the documentary term collection, where the importer pays the exporter. After the exporter ships the goods, the importer needs the shop, shipping documents to clear the goods on arrival. 
Okay? The importer holds, the bank holds the documents until the importer undertakes to pay for the goods at a later date. Can you see the difference between the documentary term collection and the documentary site collection? That under site, the, the importer would have to pay before being given the documents, whereas under documentary term collection, the importer would receive the documents having given an undertaking to pay for the goods at a later date. There are also risks that are applicable in the sense of the importance, importers and the exporters. Then we have payment post-shipment delivery. In this sense, the importer pays the exporter by telegraphic transfer on or international check after the delivery of goods. Okay? Now, um, if we need to look at the documents that are applicable, Article 20 to 38 of the UCP 500 lists out all the documents that are necessary for international transaction to occur, okay? And they are often requested by the buyer as a condition for his bank making payment. Now, they include the commercial invoice, the certificate of origin, the insurance documents, the inspection certificate, the certificate of weight and quantity, the transport documents, provisions leading to transport documents generally would be carriage on deck or shipper's load and count, clean transport document, which is a clean bill of lading, um, specific transport document, marine or ocean or port to port bill of lading, non-negotiable seaway bill, a cheta bill, uh, cheta party bill of lading, multimodal transport transportation documents and air transport documents. So dependent on what kind of transport, even road, rail and inland, courier or post receipt, transport documents issued by freight forwarders. Dependent on what kind of, um, the, the, the kind of transportation that is going to be used, these documents are key and they have to be delivered to the buyer, okay? Now the number and type of documents requested will in practice depend on the income term chosen. Remember, when we started, or from our previous two classes, we have been saying that INCO terms are so key because they determine the responsibility of the buyer, they determine the responsibility of the seller, and as a consequence, they also determine who has what document where and who is obligated to send the other party documents or provide them, okay? Now, um, there are two basic principles in summary to the letters of credit. The first, the first one is strict compliance, okay? It's under the common law, and it requires every single document tender to tally precisely with the instructions in the letter of credit, okay? And the leading case we can see is Equitable Trust Com uh, Company of New York versus Dawson, where Lord Summer set the rule and gravity of quoted sentence, there is no room for documents which are almost the same or which will just do as well. There has to be strict compliance. Please get that very clear, okay? Now, um, there are more cases that w had been set. In the case of uh, Morales, we see that the rule of insignificance did not apply and the bank was entitled to reject the goods. In that case, the discrepancy between the quantity of the shipped goods required by the letter of credit and the goods that the... Uh, from the documents which had actually been shipped was equal to 0.06%. But the bank was obligated to reject them. Why? Under the doctrine of strict compliance, we need to ensure that at all times that we comply 100%. 70% is not good, 85% is not good, neither is 95 It needs to be 100%. Okay? Now, the other doctrine would be the autonomy of the letter of credit. When you talk about the autonomy of the letter of credit, we are saying that it seems to be plain enough that the opening of a confirmed letter of credit constitutes a bargain between the banker and the vendor of the goods, which imposes upon the banker an absolute obligation to pay irrespective of any dispute there may be between the parties as to whether the goods are up to contract or not. Okay? that this letter of credit is autonomous in the sense that it obligates the banker who is in charge, who has been instructed by the buyer to pay for those goods. So not unless we are saying it is a different kind of letter of credit, maybe if it's we said revocable is where we can change it. If it's an irrevocable letter of credit, he has to, the bank has to pay because it is obligated under the principle of autonomy. Okay. 
And the case of United City Merchant versus the Royal Bank of Canada emphasized the same principle and said the whole commercial purpose for which the system confirmed irrevocable documentary credit has been developed in international trade is to give the seller an assured right to be paid before he parts with control of goods that does not permit of any dispute with the buyer as to the performance of the contract of sale being used as a ground for non-payment or reduction or deferment of payment. I think that is very clear. Remember, we are looking at it from the point that this is an international, this is a law, it's simply contract law but at an international level. So we are saying even if you try to raise the issue or, you know, the contract has not been performed to perfection, we are having issues of a... On, on that basis, then let us defer payment, let there be no payment. The issue is under autonomy of, uh, autonom the autonomous nature of the letter of credit, the bank is obligated, especially if it is an irrevocable credit, the bank is obligated to pay. Okay? Now, um, it is a fundamental principle. Um, it is a transaction between the seller and the issuing bank, and it is separate and, and, and independent and an independent transaction, and it is no way connected to other transactions. Okay? So, um, as a result of the autonomy principle, the banks do not deal with the goods, services, or performance regarding the underlying contract. The issue is, the only thing the bank is going to deal with, did we have instructions to pay? That is the only thing they're going to deal with. They're not going to get in the nitty-gritties, or, you know, the goods were not sufficient, the, they were broken, the condition, it will not look at that. It has one instruction to pay, and that is all it is going to deal with. Now, the payment obligation of the issuing bank, the beneficiary, okay, uh, the exporter, is separated from the performance of the beneficiary based on the sales contract. As long as the beneficiary presents compliant bill of documents, the issuing bank should except even though the beneficiary disobeyed the sales contract that may that they have made with the applicant who is the importer okay so we can see that this principle this principle also uh, creates independence of the underlying contract between the applicant and the bank so if the applicant goes back bankrupt today and after the bank has issued the letter of credit the applicant cannot pay the, you know when you're saying the bank is saying they cannot pay the money, the issuing bank cannot reject the payment obligation. The bank has to pay. So in general, breach of the underlying um, contract by the seller does not immune the bank from its payment undertaking. The same way the bank is not allowed to refuse payment just because of the buyer, the buyer failed to put funds in, to put it in funds in terms of putting funds in his account. Okay, so the bank is obligated. That's the autonomy of that auto, autonomy nature of that kind of contract. That the bank is obligated at all costs to pay to to pay up in terms of it, um, the instructions that it had first received. Now, what are the exceptions to this? There are a number of exceptions that would allow a bank not to pay. But the most key, or what would be most relevant today, would be the fraud exception. You see, the principle of autonomy is set up so steadily, but it is not absolute. Because in the event that fraud is established, then the banks um, would be, would be um, relieved of that duty to actually pay. So if there's any fraud, okay, any kind of fraud that, ha that is realized, then the banks are relieved from their instruction. Part of the fraud would be forgery, where we are making a false document to deceive, and the purpose is to defraud um, the bank of sums of money. So the act of making that false document not only does not, only does not constitute forgery until and unless the prosecution and claimant are able to prove, okay, are able to prove that there was forgery. So just making a claim and saying, oh, you know, the documents are forged is not sufficient. We have to prove there has to be some 
form of litigation that has taken place. That we have gone to court, we have presented the documents, we have presented the facts before the court, and the court has actually agreed with the prosecution and the claimant that there was forge, forgery in that sense. So in that, the, then the bank is um, released from its obligation. In the case of Yap Tun Choi uh, versus Hong Leon Bank Bahad and another, the court held that the act of forgery is not established if it had been made out of negligence because there is no presence of intention. It is forbidden that forgery can be a vehicle to commit other offenses such as fraud, cheating, breach of trust, misappropriation of property, and falsification of documents. Okay? Now, intention, what is fraud? Fraud is intentionally deceiving another party. It is a criminal offense under common law and civil violation under civil law. While companies claim transparency, okay, or on the surface may seem safe, failing or fully investigate the party you are contracting with is an invitation for fraud. So Article 3.8 of the Yundruat Principles of International con Contract states, a party may avoid the contract when it has been led to conclude the contract by the other party's fraudulent uh, representation, including language or practices, or a party may avoid the contract when it has been led to conclude non-disclosure of circumstances which, according to reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing, the latter party should have disclosed. So if you know for a fact that you have failed to meet those uh, conditions that are set out in Article 3.8 of the New Drug, Uni Drug Principles, then I essentially, you are acting in a fraudulent manner, and the other party, the latter party, should not be obligated under the principle of autonomy of the letter of credit to pay. The bank should not pay. Okay? Now, um, while most, of, most often it is considered a matter of criminal offense, during the 20, uh, 22nd October 2007 UN General Assembly, the Commission Secretary noted the increase increasing attention to the area of commercial fraud, which is considered to be one of the present day greatest threats. And part of it would be the, the, the development in technology, because we now are able to use technology in different ways in terms of even uh, contracting and sending documents under the EUCP. Therefore, we are, it is a wider door, or there is a wider path in terms of fraudulent um, transactions in terms of uh, space where the, this can actually happen. Now, um, so what we need to understand is that fraud is actually affecting international trade. And remember that the principle of autonomy is a lifeline, is a lifeline of the international trade. We are saying that banks are obligated no matter what Banks are obligated to ensure that at all times they meet the standards or they meet their instructions. Now, there is a, that is why, therefore, it is important for us to, to have policies that are counteract, counteracting fraud. Now, the primary legal instrument against fraud is a so-called fraud exception. Based on such an exception, the buyer may request an injunction to stop the bank from paying the seller um, on the credit. The problem is that here the fraud usually concerns the documents or the underlying transaction. Therefore, invoking the fraud exception inevitably conflicts with the preservation of the autonomy principle. In other terms, allowing banks or applicants to put forward the fraud, to put forward the fraud ground in order to avoid or recoup payment amounts lead to creating a link between the letter of credit and the contract. And therefore, it breaches the golden rule of autonomy. Okay? Now, having understood that, then the English courts are ex extremely diffident towards fraud exception. However, following the U.S. case law um, in Setgen versus Henry Sh uh, Schroeder Bank Corp., the House of Lords held that the exception for fraud on the part of the beneficiary Seeking to avail himself of the credit is a clear application of the maxim ex tupi causa non orita 
action or. In, in plain English, it is to be preferred fraud and ravels all. The courts will not allow this, this process to be used by a dishonest person to carry out fraud. Okay? Now, therefore, fraud exception is a part of the common law which consistently accepts a, lim a limitation to the principle of autonomy. Moreover, if the, fraud, if, if the case of fraud is clearly established, that is, if the claimant can prove clearly an, an obvious fraud and the, and the bank's knowledge, it may even be possible to obtain an injunction against the beneficiaries who are the sellers and the banks preventing them respectively from requesting payment and from paying. So I hope that it is very clear that we can see that for these letters of do, uh, documentary credit, they are important tools in international trade. They facilitate international trade, but it is also very key for us to understand um, what kind of letter of credit you are using. Um, if uh, the INCO terms that are applicable, the documents that have been requested to be provided by the buyer, and if the seller has met those documents, and also to ensure that the basic principles of strict compliance and autonomy have been met. If all those factors are standing, then you can have a, a successful trade. Um, we can have a successful trade um, or, um, deliberation in that sense. So kindly feel free to send me any question on my email. You know my email is mkithinji at mku.ac.ke. I'll be ready and willing to respond to any questions that you may have concerning documentary credits. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.